So he's like the Kyle of our podcast. Yep. And welcome. Hey, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> to the Down in Front Podcast, the, the official Down podcast, podcast of downinfrontpodcast.com. Down Shut up, guys. I'm doing the intro. God damn it. <laughs> I thought it was great. <laughs> you kept talking over it. No, no. It was uh, echoing you. It was sort of like a trailing. It was like, like the, the Three Stooges. Hello, hello, hello. I've never seen that show. What? Yeah. It's too many white people. And welcome to the Down in Front Podcast, the official podcast of downinfrontpodcast.com. My name is Warren. I will be your host this evening, and I am super pumped to be bringing you a movie review called Next Gen that is out on Netflix right now. If you are tuning in for the first time here at the Down in Front Podcast, what we usually do is get together. We hang out over a campfire. Uh, we have some s'mores, and we uh, crack a, our favorite beer or drink that we're going to be choosing, talk about some movies that we've been watching, some other stuff that we've been doing, and we review a film. And so that film will be next gen. And the peeps that I have with me is a bit of the original version two crew. I'd there we I'd go. Say it's, I said gen two. Oh, noise. Oh, shit. I could have used that. Yeah. I yeah. have it's, the next gen crew. I'm sorry, guys. It's I, the following gen. prime of this podcast. I'll, 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 <laughs> right? I'll get good. From uh, the mouth of the South, the man who needs no introductions but looks like a baby today since he's shaven. My goodness. I have <laughs> Mr. Brylan. Brylan, how's it going, man? What you been sipping on and what you been watching? I'm doing well tonight. Thank you for having me once again. Uh, what I'm drinking right now is a whiskey that was recommended to me by my local um, liquor store proprietor. It's called Hawk Stodler's Slow and Low uh, Rock and Rye. And it has, it is union made. It's straight rye whiskey with raw honey, navel orange, rock candy, and bitters. It tastes sweet. It tastes smooth. I definitely recommend it. It's 84 proof. And it's sold at pharmacies and saloons all across the country since 1888. I missed the days when those were one and the same. Yeah. <laughs> like going to the uh, barber was also your doctor's appointment. It was like, that back. It's like CVS. CVS is almost very close to being a saloon and a pharmacy because there's something that you can buy a straight handle of whiskey and still pick up your inhaler because you have asthma or something. I don't yeah. Know. They'll do a. They'll do a complimentary leeching if you ask them nicely, too. Oh, word? For free? <laughs> yeah, need, pretty much. I mean, you get up on that. <laughs> uh, what I watched recently, I watched uh, the Nick Cage movie, Mandy. Uh, I will say it is it is an entertaining movie. It is not a bad movie at all. But there's some really cool things that they do about it. I like that it's kind of a uh, throwback to 70s horror, which is really cool. And yeah, as much as Nick Cage is all Nick Cage in it, uh, what's really cool is the other actors are there to try to out Nick Cage him. So it becomes this craziness where everybody's just trying to act as nuts as possible. Definitely worth uh, renting and checking out. Probably not everybody's taste, but I think it was a fun, enjoyable time. And the other thing I watched uh, since I've been playing through Spider-Man, I decided to revisit Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, one thing I'll say is, uh, I really like that compared to the previous Spider-Man movies, how much they show like New York appreciation and culture in that, uh, movie. Uh, like if you look at the first, uh, Spider-Man, they had that very cheesy end with the green goblin where everybody was throwing stuff at him off the Brooklyn bridge and saying, you mess with Spider-Man, you mess with all of New York. And it was, it was fun for that time, but doesn't really play that well now. But in Sp Spider-Man Homecoming, you have like the conversation, like Delmar's, uh, Delhi, where he's talking about his aunt and his uh, daughter and how they're just busting each other's balls and it's just like a new york way i thought was just very cool about that movie that was well done yeah nice i uh this is may have been one of the first movies that uh 
Abbott, uh, host of the Fear Bonus podcast, another person actually <laughs> watched uh, his one of his uh, shows, and so Abbott recommended watching Mandy. Uh, I think maybe a week or so ago, and so I saw Brylan post on it. I'm like, no way. There's no way this movie's that good. But you know, we'll see. You know, we got two people. You know, Abbott's uh, pretty unique, uh, and Brylan's Brylan. So we need one more person that's going to watch Mandy. So I'm going to vote maybe Mocha. That's going to watch Mandy next and uh, give us his take on it. I'll do it. I'm always down for a good Nick Cage romp. There you go. <laughs> Nick Cage rom-com? Oh, that's what I need in my life. <clears throat> All the way in uh, Mr. New York City, we have the Mocha, Mike. Uh, Mocha, how's it going, man? It's good to see your face. Uh, what you drinking and what you been watching? Great to see all of your faces as well. Um, as for what I am drinking, I tried really hard to find a beer that was somehow on theme uh, regarding robots or literally anything that had to do with this movie, but I couldn't. But what I did find was the Montauk Wave Chaser India Pale Ale. For those of you who aren't watching live, this is a beer that is in a purple and white can, and the purple perfectly matches the hair of our heroine. So that's on theme. As far as I'm concerned, we're also not streaming this, so there's no way anyone could watch live except for the three of us. Wow, <laughs> wow! Way to blow up our way to spot. State the obvious. Our <laughs> spot together. Gosh. Well, anyway, it's purple. It's tasty. I like it, and it's Long Island based. Rep the hometown. Um, as for what I'm watching, I haven't been watching anything new. Like I'm currently catching up on My Hero Academia, which I've talked about already in this podcast. But I will say that what I am excited to watch, which airs tonight, is the season premiere of season two of The Gifted on Fox. Very excited to have that show back in my life. It was a solid X-Men TV show that completely surprised me with its quality. And I can't wait to see where season two takes it and all the new characters that they introduce. So, uh, so yeah, that's what I will be watching. I'm super excited to have an anime recap because I know that there's a good amount of shows that have come and gone and has even started and doing strong. But uh, as much as we talk about it a lot, Mocha, um, My Hero Academia, you definitely need to catch up. But you really need to catch up on Attack on Titan on so many different levels. We, You know you're behind, vastly behind. But I'm super pumped because Hunter Hunter just came back today. So I'm very excited about that comic. Um, so some deep cuts that I like anime. I like reading a bunch of like manga stuff. It's pretty cool. But we definitely need to have a conversation about it at some point. Cool. Yeah. I want to watch the Dragon Prince that's on Netflix now. And um, Darling and Franks is one that I've heard of. That's supposed to be a really cool mecha anime that's going on right now. Darling and Frank? Darling <laughs> and Franks. It's so such a weird title. It has to be a good anime, you know? Man, if there's a Robo and Frank in there, I'm gonna be so excited. <laughs> I'm gonna be so excited. Man, I sound like Avid. I've been hanging out with him too much. <laughs> well, Mocha's always great to see your face. Uh, I'm gonna toss it over to my best friend. We grew up together. We've been in kindergarten in second grade. The Shredder, Mr. Blewett. How's it going, man? What you been sipping on? Loving the beard and uh, what you been watching? I do remember that teacher in that year that we were both in kindergarten together at that school. Uh, Very specific. So tonight I'm sipping on the Silent Shroud. It is an aromatic, aromatic, aromantic, uh, American pale ale. uh, Quite good by Relic Brewing. Um, Literally just got it because the can. Uh, I know there's robot themed beers out there. I just... I hadn't seen the movie before I got the beer for tonight, so I didn't know what to actually like thematically go for. Um, As for what I've been watching, it's been a while. And honestly, the uh, the old girlfriend broke her ankle. So we've been watching more Netflix than I would have ever watched in my life before. Most of it's been comedians and catching up on Marvel shows and like some various other things. I will say this. I know that Brylan talked about it probably last time, but American Vandal season two, we did in like one episode one night, two episodes the next night, three episodes the next night, and then just four episodes to finish the whole season. That is pure brilliance. Like they say yeah. in the season, Pooh is always funny. And it is. And I thought it was the most, it was amazing. Um, as someone who grew up in a like, I know I'm called affectionately the shredder on this and uh, music is kind of my thing, but I, I grew up and hung out with a lot of like sports people 
growing up. And Demarcus Tillerson is a real human being. <laughs> like, that's a true character. Yeah. I know people that are like that. Like, I'm friends with people like that. Uh, they're in the next room over, and hopefully they can hear me and burst in here and just be like, what the fuck are you talking about, bitch? Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, so it's it, – that was – that third episode when they just focus on him was maybe one of the funniest half hours of television I've ever had. Go yeah. see that. Go see that show. It is amazing. Nice. Well, as always, I'm excited to uh, get your opinion because this is a little bit different of a movie that I don't think we've reviewed an animated film in a while. Um, Since Final Glory. We've... Man, that was like last year. Oof. Uh, I think there was another animated film we reviewed. I just can't uh, remember. Like uh, Coco. Or- Life of Dogs. Life of Dogs. Isle of Dogs. That's not. I was like, Life of Dogs. What? Dogs. Uh, I think I think you were getting Life Aquatica and Isle of Dogs mixed up. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> there you go. I think that might have been it though, right? Yeah. Isle of Dogs. Yeah, but that wasn't quite like animated like this one is. Unless it counted. Uh, I mean, it wasn't CGI, but it was yeah. definitely animation. Yeah, I mean, it was a type of animation, but I think it was Coco, whoever said that was uh, correct. Infinity War is hella animated, too, so... Where? Infinity War. Hmm. All right. You know, (laughs) so fun fact, I was reading about this, speaking of the animation, real quick. Uh, Apparently, this was done with a program called Blender, which is a free application. And it cut the budget cost because they didn't have to do the whole licensing thing. Like, an insane amount. Down. This movie was designed all in Blender. That's yeah. incredible. Is yeah, that like no. Grinder? No. <laughs> yeah, it's not as good, but it's still pretty solid for okay. a free app. Okay. But I mean, that is the, actually the whole movie. Pretty, was, that's just pretty badass, though. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, the whole movie was done in something that didn't cost the studio anything. Yeah, it's also and cool. Work harder, this, work smarter. this is one of the first releases by Alibaba where they're producing movies now. Oh Which really? What? Alibaba? Yeah. I need They're to do just more doing research. everything. This yeah, I didn't. I didn't even know that. Good stuff. Yeah. Damn. All right. Well, I mean, that, especially in the look of the movie, and we're going to get into some of our non-spoiler sections. But overall, the look of the movie, I was just actually super impressed. Um, so it's great to hear this information of you know Alibaba and using an actual software that's free that you can actually use to make something that looks this good. Um, that's actually pretty cool. So good on them. Good on them. And I am Warren. I'll be your host this evening. Uh, what I am sipping on is a Dr. Pepper and Jameson. I uh, didn't know what this movie was about at all. Um, so I didn't even know it was even sci-fi. I didn't even know it was animated until I saw um, Mocha's picture about it. But uh, now that I did, the main ca- one of the main characters' name is Seven. I believe Dr. Pepper has seven other flavors in it. So I'm getting the signal that it's... Six six six. Uh, actually, it's seventy seven. Project seventy seven. But he has a seven in it, so there you go. That counts for something. Uh, what I've been watching, I have. Um, we're still going on. We are doing season three, almost at season four for our Mad Men binge. So super pumped about that for me. Watching that. Um, the other thing that I've took a look at and I've been watching was a simple little favor. I think it's called with uh, Anna Kendrick and Blake Lively. Was her name? Uh, and also the star from Crazy Rich Asians. I can't remember his name. Oh, yeah. He also stars in that. Um, so, you know, given a, a non-spoiler oh, section, God. you know, it's an interesting film. Uh, I think it was nice because I was definitely coming off of the last one we watched before was Predators. And uh, if you've listened to that, you know that we were upset about that movie. So I think I was kind of bummed at trying not to be burned, but I felt like Emma and her brother really wanted to go to this movie. So we went and go watched it. Uh, and I thought it was pretty interesting. I thought it was pretty fun. Um, it was definitely a crazy story. And at this, at one point I'm like, is this based on a true story? How crazy it was. So it was definitely fun. I definitely would suggest, you know, if that movie's out besides the last few movies that we've done, definitely go check out simple favor. I think you, you'll be enjoyed. I think you, uh, you'll find some, some, um, some cool things about that movie, especially Bleak Lively's character was great in it. She was pretty much of a bitch the entire time, but it was great. Um, so yeah, that what is what I've been watching and what I've been drinking. 
So we're pumped. Um, usually what we're going to be doing is that we ask a couple questions, but we're going to get right into this actual review. We want to go ahead and unpack this actual section. So if you haven't seen Next Gen yet, it's actually a Netflix right now. So definitely go check it out. It's an hour and 45 minutes. Super quick watch. Does not take that long to watch it at all. Uh, come back here, pick up where we left off, and we were going to be continuing with a full review of Next Gen. And we will see you in a moment. And we are back, and we are the Down in Front Podcast. My name is Warren. I'm with Brylin, Mocha, and Blewett. Tonight, we are getting ready to give you a full review of Next Gen. So we are in our spoiler section. So if you haven't seen this movie, definitely go check it out. It's on Netflix. You know, it's a lot of people have that ability. If not, email us, and maybe I'll share your password, but probably not. So what we're going to be doing is breaking this up in a couple different sort of sections. We'll be talking about the voice acting and a bit of the story. And sometimes we even kind of sprinkle in some world building of how it actually looked. And then next we're going to talk about like the likeness of other films and some of the violence. So we do want to kind of mention that in a little bit in our second section. So I'll toss it over to Brylin. And um, as always, is Brylin, tell me what you got. Yeah. So uh, th- with this movie, uh, one of the things that really stood out for me was how well the cast was. Uh, for um, for what they brought to this film, because I really didn't hear about this wasn't really heavily marketed or anything, so you wouldn't really think it would have a, like a star-studded cast. But they got some really good people in here, like John Krasinski as uh, seventy-seven and uh, Shirley Nee as um, the young girl uh, May. That uh, their chemistry is really well done, and it's uh, pulled off, I think, as superbly in the story they have to tell of a young girl that's faced some severe loss in her life, but also she's able to kind of learn from her mistakes and also make those mistakes too, which is something you really don't see a lot in a children's film. You just hear the mistakes spoken about and then the the corrections done. Whereas this one, it's they kind of don't really put a filter on it. You get to see like when she gets angry, what, that can lead to and i think that was done superbly well uh by those two characters uh i also think jason sudeikis was awesome as um the uh main bad guy aries and um what was the uh steve Jobs style person name oh is it just him pim justin pim yeah i thought he was really done well but probably a little uh it's a little over top but still um I think it was good. Like, I mean, they definitely show like he's definitely an evil guy right at the beginning. So it's not some, that's a surprise or anything. What's a surprise is about his humanity, which I thought was a really interesting twist. Um, but, um, I would say the big voiceover actor that really shined in here was David Cross. Not only was he really good as the scientist that makes 77, but also he plays the voice of a lot of the Q-bots, but also like a mailbox and a toilet and a toothbrush and a comb. And it was really cool that all these have to have robot voices, but they all have their own little unique personalities to them. So I thought that was definitely a very big uh, point of why I enjoy this movie a lot. I will say this, almost every single turn of the movie had David Cross saying some sort of hilarious old-timey phrase, which I love. Like, literally every time they went into a new scenario, there's just David Cross playing a little robot that just goes, unhand me, you. Wrong turn, I'm, I will have you. Like, yeah. <laughs> And that just, it, it immediately brings a smile to your face and kind of reduces the levity of the situation to remind you that, like, yes, this is a kid's movie. What else you got, Mocha? Um, yeah, you know, for me, it was it was really cool hearing David Cross just in general. That guy is great, great, and he has such a he has such an iconic voice, yet was somehow able to 
gives slight modifications to it for all the different characters that he played to the point where some of them I didn't even realize were him. Um, I feel, though, like he was the standout in terms of voice acting for this movie. You know, uh, we had great actors like Jason Sudeikis, uh, John Krasinski, um, and they were they were solid. Like they played their roles well, but I didn't actually get much out of their characters and didn't even know that th- that it was them. But not from a way that was oh they were disguising themselves well, just that they sounded kind of bland, like they could have been anybody. But yeah, I, yo Mocha, I'll agree with you on that. I think that so Sudeikis I thought was a decent performance, and it was definitely. He doesn't play villains much, but he did it all right this time. You know, like yeah. it, you don't hear Jason Sudeikis and think like, oh, there's like the menacing villain. <laughs> but I thought he did a pretty good job, all things considered. Uh, Krasinski was my big loser of the cast. Um, he I know that man has inside in- it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, mostly just inside. But um, <laughs> But yeah, like I know he he is an incredibly well he's very well spoken. He has a very distinguished voice and I don't think he did enough. It just seemed like the whole thing was kind of phoned in like, oh, yes, I remember you. The memories that we have are very important. There was no real like look at the camera type situations where I like, you know, he just talked about Pam and was like in love with her and stuff. And he looks over the camera, you know, like that, that is the John Krasinski that just wraps around your brain. is like, Oh yeah, he's that nerdy guy that everyone likes. Yeah. And it's probably something they they take that takes away because he's just doing the voice and it's not him acting it out. That he is trying to play a robot. And there are some like beats that only the animators can do that. He can't do with his voice. It just seemed like something was off. Like it wasn't, it wasn't, it, you're maybe you're right. It wasn't timed up with the animation, right? Like, or the animators didn't do enough to like put that in there, but it just seemed like he didn't emote as much as I know he is capable of as an actor. So I definitely hear what you're saying, Brylan, regarding it being like just a robot. And I do agree with you to an extent, but I will also point out the fact that we just kind of heap praise on David Cross for being able to do a lot with different robot voices. So I feel like there's some room there. Um, but yeah, no, I, like yeah, it was just a robot, but I agree there was it was a little it was a little bit uh, lifeless at times, and I wonder if this was John Krasinski's first time doing a voice act uh, overall. Do we know that? Yeah, because that's exactly what I was gonna say because I was curious about that. Yeah, because it's actually it's pretty difficult to do uh, voice acting in general, and sometimes yeah. for some actors it can just be uh, like too much of a different uh, monster to really execute in the same way they would if they were interacting with people on a stage or on a sound set. Well, I know we're going to be also talking about this a little bit later, but I know um, talking about as a whole of the voice acting. I mean, when it comes to voice acting, I try to make it so that I I try to I I like the fact that I can't like pinpoint an actor or an actress or some sort of performer from their voice. Um, And so if I can, I'm like, I don't know if you're doing enough. And so I immediately picked out, you know, Jason Sudeikis pretty easily because I felt like he was just talking in his normal voice. And I'm like, okay, well, it doesn't feel like you're trying. I actually didn't pinpoint anybody else um, besides Michael Pena. Um, And so, and again, for his role, it just felt like he was talking in his normal voice. Uh, But I couldn't actually tell anybody else until I looked it up on IMDb. And, you know, that's interesting because, you know, we talked about and we'll be talking about likeness of the actual other characters in other movies. and. There are other characters that are pro- like very prominent that are very similar um, to this robot or seven seven two three was his name or seven seven Project seventy seven Project, Project seventy seven okay so with Project seventy seven that was played by John Krasinski I felt like he had the chance to live up but he was definitely still being I guess in the back of my mind it was a comparing and he kept comparing to all these other people that had like a distinct voice and a distinct characteristic and I think the other thing that I guess tunes into me is um watching a um a uh robot sort of emote a little bit you know seeing the eyes seeing the face seeing the mouth or the nose sometimes that also is going to be tying me into like how they actually how the robot is feeling right or how that voice actor is actually doing you know just key example you know genie for example you know with uh, robin williams right he has a full face and you get much more of that character whereas if you see some of the robots that we have here even with iron the giant he has a full face you have his eyes you have him squinting he has mouth um, this one, it looks like, uh, even with Wally, for example, right, we still get a lot of those things. Whereas here, 
sometimes you get a mouth, sometimes you don't get a mouth from the design of it. And I think depending on what was happening, I, I was losing some of the uh, acting that uh, John Krasinski was doing for that character, Project 77. So that was a bit for me. I was kind of really kind of hoping for a little bit more. Um, but, you know, on the opposite side, I guess all these other kind of weird and quirky characters that David Cross was doing, even beating kids up in the soccer field, um, I thought that was, you know, at least we were getting more from there. And even it was like a weird juxt- juxtaposition of the space was like super um, polite and the face was very unalarming. And yet what he was saying is very alarming sort of sentences of like, hey, just take this beating and be be OK with it. Um, so I thought that was kind of kind of funny, and so it was kind of weird they had at least focused on some of the characters, some of the robots, to give them more, more of those features so you can understand them a little bit better. Whereas Project Seventy Seven, we didn't quite get that enough, and I think we needed that a little bit more. Yeah, one but one cool thing I like I think they did with Project Seventy Seven that uh, you mentioned was like the mouth that um, he was just too wise until he befriended May, and once he befriended May, he get got that little smirk on his face. And then from there on out, I could feel like that relationship grow, that they became more connected after that moment because he did grow that mouth. And you could start to see the performance be supported better by that little animation versus just the two eyes, which I thought was really cool. It goes one step farther than that. He grew the mouth when he ditched the weapons. Yeah. So mm. like he ditched all of his wow. offensive capabilities, and that's when he grew the the like the stupid little grin and the, the rest of the smile. I didn't yeah. make that connection. That's pretty dope. I didn't yeah. either. I read yeah. it on IMDb. <laughs> I made the, I made that connection, and that was in yeah. my notes. And you just spoiled it. It just me. it just touched the heart a little bit more once you saw that little smile come on his face. I thought that was really cool. Um, but uh, with Michael Pena, yeah, I think he was under underserved in this movie. Uh, they gave him some lines that weren't really Michael Pena lines. He was cussing a lot and they bleep it and it's all about like just dog nature which is really interesting take that you have michael Pena just being like oh you're judging me you're judging me you're judging me and he's cussing in the middle of it and stuff and it's like oh you should go that way it was really cool to see like that uh, 77 could understand dog speak uh but i think you need to have a little bit more Michael Pena because he's funny when he's a motor mouth and you needed that dog to not shut up ever. So I, that amazing. I think that you needed more Michael Pena in a wrinkle of time, but you <laughs> did not need more Michael Pena in this movie. I love Michael Pena. Don't, don't get me wrong, but I think that he was appropriately used. Like that dog character was just perfect in like, Oh, only one person can understand him, and he just kind of yaps the rest of the time. And the whole bit where he got stuck with like the door on his head, <laughs> yeah, I thought that was, that was like well played through the entire movie, and it had a big payoff yeah. in the end. You know, yeah. Um, I don't think you necessarily needed to have him speaking more than that. Ballsy to to like have your fifth character swear that much in a kids movie. <laughs> like that that but was as long cool. as they bleeped it out it's fine uh brylon what else you got so in terms of the um the story uh i think the story actually has a lot of cool lessons going for it that i think they really did a really good job of not um just defying or just playing it safe they wanted to show like kind of the bad side and good th- side of things warts and all which i definitely highly respect out of this movie uh for like uh the loss of someone in your life when you're very young for this instant may it lost her uh father due to divorce we assume uh and that it's something that's been tearing her up and she doesn't know how to react so she's acting out of rage and it's unfocused and everything and when she starts and she does this thing that hates robots because her mom loves them so much and that's kind of like her rebellion in this thing that uh, once she befriends a robot or a robot wants to follow her around and kind of learn from her that she's being very opportunistic with the robot too, that uh, she's like, all right, I can get back at my bullies with this robot. I can go ahead and vandalize property and be a punk and uh, just lash out a little bit more because I got this robot on my side now and nobody can get in my way. And it leads to and it's cool to see that when she does use him before uh that when he he has his weapons and everything that it's um really cool to see that they don't uh really 
kind of gloss over the, like the violence of using military grade weapons on things like when another cubot is destroyed by 77 it's kind of horrifying because he's evaporating them and just pretty much destroying them into little bits when he throws like one of the bully cubots from the uh, rival soccer girl up in the air and shoots it and everybody else just runs away in fear and she's just and may is just like celebrating that it's like yeah we got him but she does this, she know what she actually is asking for at that time which i thought was done really really well and it's cool to see their journey and growth as friends and also them learning lessons from one another the whole idea of like memories are what makes us and our memories of shared experiences are what makes our friendship uh happen and real i thought was really cool and so when when um 77 has the final sacrifice of actually having to reboot his system and lose all those memories. It's really cool to see that uh, not only do we get like a really badass robot on robot action scene, but also it's something where it's like he's losing a bit of himself that he grew on his own bit by bit as he tries to protect the city and protect humanity as well. Um, but I do think that this movie, uh, its dialogue is kind of too simplistic for these lessons. And it's, I think they played it safe for a little bit that the dialogue is kind of from the practice of just say what you are looking at right now. It's like very obvious dialogue. So it's mm-hmm. just pretty much like, um, well, I can't use weapons because weapons are super violent and not meant to just get back at your bullies. And it's like, yeah, that's obviously the lesson we want to learn, but kind of use some type of parable or some metaphor to speak upon that lesson to have a better impact yeah. uh, with what you want to tell as a story. That's a good call out because I think the one thing that I kept, I, I just kept going back to, man, you guys gloss over that. Man, you guys kind of skipped that. And I don't know if at a moment they were really kind of focused on like the visual aspect of it and not so much the script, but the fact that you didn't, you like this movie doesn't even take the time to really delve into the fact that, uh, you know, um, uh, the robots, you know, 77 has to dump his memories every time because he's getting the warning. He's getting a warning, says a hey, critical error, critical error. And that's happening. And he's choosing to save these memories. He's now trying to kind of battle between, you know, all the memories that saved from him. And even while he's there, he's choosing to save, you know, bad memories and good memories because that's what's really kind of shaping their friendship. And so I was seeing a lot coming from 77. Um, and a lot of the growth from that character and, you know, ultimately you knew what was going to happen, right? They already set it up to the fact that he's going to have to delete his memories. That was an easy, like we knew where it was going to go, but I at least liked seeing the, the constant reminder of there's constant sacrifices that he has to make to make this partnership, to make this friendship work. The thing that I was having a bit of an issue with is, and I'm glad you brought it up. I did need, I, I would like to have seen more from the mother's character, from May's mother's character. And although you don't have to touch on it or you don't have to explain it more, but, it doesn't feel like her mother was there for her, arguably at all, up until at the end her life was in danger. Uh, but yeah. we don't see her mother kind of consoling her. We see a little bit when she gets into a fight, but she only focuses on like the technology. And even for the fact that I was hoping that there will be a moment that talks about how her father left, you know, potentially for divorce. But it looks like her father was a soccer player that clearly like played soccer and it seems to just left to play soccer, um, so which soccer. is even worse. Yes, those fucking hooligans. Um, so I really was I was trying to get more if, between that, right? I think you had mentioned a little bit about this, Brylin, of, you know, just don't tell me what we're literally are seeing. You know, show me, like, what's kind of in these inside these characters to kind of draw it out a little bit more. Because if one character on the end is making all these sacrifices, the other's character is kind of lost, thinking May and 77's, like, relationship. I feel like we need a bit more because I was definitely on 77's side. You knew the turn was going to happen at some point, but it felt like May for the entire time was just like super angry and couldn't see past anything up until a pivotal moment. But it felt like, you know, there was no redeeming qualities for her at all. Uh, and it was tough to really kind of like her from my, in my standpoint. Yeah. That's why I think the, uh, 77's, uh, 
the time he takes to remove his memories is probably some of the most powerful visual <laughs> elements you have. You have the like the little paper shredder icon and how he splays out his operating system like Tony Stark does is really cool. That's cool. But just to see him actually have to make a choice and say this memory can no longer exist, I think that's very deep and powerful that it's just like Oh my gosh, I would never think that if you had like an artificial intelligence that's at this level of understanding and perception that it actually has to make choices if it runs out of space, what is it going to actually get rid of? And Mm -hmm. having that old, and gradually we see that he starts to think that, I mean, he starts, he decides all the memories are good that you shouldn't delete anything about her because the friendship's that powerful. Let's get rid of our weapon system. And I think that's one of the like more powerful moments of the movie. So. Um, I will say this in regard to, uh, at least the reference to his memories, there was something that I thought was really subtly done. And there was a lot of sub- subtlety and detail in this movie when it came to the animation. But for this, from a story perspective, when, uh, when Project 77 and May first meet, um you know it's this kind of sudden moment he wakes up after touching her and doesn't really know how like isn't really communicating with her immediately or at least not a natural way and the first thing that that happens that she really says to him is like give me back back my backpack i need that and then she gets separated from him and the backpack gets left behind and he picks it up and decides oh she needs this i need to get it to her and so we, we go on that first chase scene on the highway he gets blasted and when he finally crashes and gets a chance to relax he opens up that backpack and the first thing that he pulls out is the photograph and that photograph to him he makes that connection like oh this is a memory and this is important to her and that moment informs the rest of his character's development from an ai perspective from the movie because when he is having those moments in the garage by himself he's opening up his own memories and seeing photographs and he knows this was like these are important to may maybe they should be important to me too Mm -hmm. and it's it was just like very really interesting to see how it's sort of how the AI itself developed um, from like some more, I'll say primitive functions, even though it wasn't really primitive, but to uh, like a more nuanced understanding of what it meant to be, to have a mind of your own. Uh, And I thought that was really understated and really, really just cool in general. Um, And then also just a quick point about the mom, Warren, I know you said that you wish that she was more present, but I think that was kind of the point for her character. And I think this was also understated, but you know, the movie went on a lot about, or it talked a lot about what, how people deal with grief in general and we see it through may's eyes in terms of her you know self-described uh unfocused rage and how all that stems from the pain that she feels from losing her dad and also like losing some sort of like direction or a feeling of safety or whatever it may be um but with the mom you know she's so obsessed with technology because she's trying to fill that void of loneliness and pain that her that her husband dying like left like left in her and so the fact that she was like not attentive to May and it's in, in a, to an extent that was almost abusive uh, was I thought pretty powerful too in its own way. Mm. Okay. I was just hoping to get a bit more. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so three things immediately to respond to that. I think that people uh, today without the loss and trauma are trying to fill a, a void with like technology. You know, you see people on, well, I don't have these, but I, I, read news stories and so tell me if I'm wrong but um, like people see people on Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat living like these supposedly luxurious lives and that's all it is it's literally just like pseudo luxury for likes Um, and it's completely just filling a void that you don't have in your own life so you could like vicariously see it through another Uh, so that was well done in like a nice social commentary behind the scenes um, the other thing was that uh, from a, a, like a neurological perspective, the brain does this all the time where it chooses memories to delete. Like you cannot remember everything you've ever done at any point. Like truthfully, once I edit this podcast, there's going to be significant chunks, chunks of tonight that I will not remember accurately within 48 hours, you know, Um and that's not saying anything about me. I mean, I have a terrible memory. That's true. But like, I think that's, that's consistent with most humans. And it is an interesting commentary where like 
your brain has to make these arbitrary decisions on what to delete and what to remember and what to remember in what ways, you know, you can frame a certain situation like, uh, for example, when, uh, you know, seven, seven, two, three first met may, may thought it was the worst situation in the world. Whereas seven to seven thought it was like this great momentous occasion. Like he's like, well, you know, this is you, I met you. And so that's how the his memory remembers that that situation rather than like this really like, you know, her just making fun of him. Um, yeah, he looks the, at an amount of significance of knowledge versus emotional impact. Right. But it was a unique standpoint on our own memory. And I don't think this is on purpose. I think I might be just reading into this too much where where people can attach arbitrary feelings to certain memories that the the random thing that gets forgotten in two days by some person might be a life changing moment for someone else. Um, the third thing was, oh yeah, uh, I forget who said it, but the the father relationship, uh, being the soccer player, totally thought that was going to be uh, Pim. I, I completely yeah, was too. just yeah. like, <laughs> as soon as they said something about my father dying, and then they showed a picture of like Pim for some reason, or it might've been reversed. And like, they showed a picture and be like, Oh my father, I was like, Oh dude, that's totally, he got brainwashed and he's going to have to make some sort of like comeback moment. And to be fair, I think it's been too soon since I saw the movie to really care one, like not care, but like have strong feelings the either way. Um, I think either ending could have worked of him being just straight up a robot. I will say this. It did, a little bit less in the impact because we really didn't know the character pre robot. So when he had the whole revelation that like, Oh, I killed him and replaced him was not, not as impactful because we didn't know the character. Um, whereas if they made it more of a humanistic character of like, Oh, it's my father. Fun fact. No, it isn't. It's a robot that took my father's place. It would have carried a little bit more weight to our protagonist and therefore us. Sorry. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, wrapping up the, the the comments before me. Yeah, I was just saying that was a good call out. Uh, what else do we have for uh, the voice acting kind of story, a bit of the world building section here? So, I was actually really impressed with the world building in this film. It was fully realized. Uh, they had a lot of detail. Um, a lot of thought was clearly put into what a world. Uh, what a, what our world could look like if it went on the trajectory of um, convenience at all costs. I thought that the application of robots, even in like the background during like panning shots throughout the city, let alone in like the day to day robots that May's character encounters with frustration, was really just phenomenal and like shockingly detailed. Um, as well as just the visuals too. The visuals were so so finely detailed. You know, whether it was Project 77's eyes, you know, circling, like spinning, like light spinning in circles when you when they were up close uh, and you could sort of see a little bit of shake in the LEDs like as they were going. Um, the one of the most like one of the things that actually took me aback and like kind of made my jaw drop a bit was when May first sees Project 77 and she puts her hand on his chest plate when she pulls her hand off. There's a little bit of condensation there in the shape of her hand the same way like it would be if you put your hand on like a really cold, really clean piece of metal and it just kind of fades away and it's super subtle and understated. And I was just really impressed by the level of detail they put in to not just little things like that, but also all the um, like face faces, facial features and the reactions and even that fight scene at the end. The whole thing was actually really incredibly done visually. And that's that makes it even more shocking to me, uh, Blew it with your, your announcement that it was all made in Blender. Cause that's like, that's, that's just really, really cool. Yeah. One thing I would add on to that is I loved how rational, like the relationship between robots and humans were this kind of, it feels like this is where society is like a hundred or maybe 200 years before Wally happens where mm. not everybody's just stuck in a chair just yet and being force fed food and entertainment and stuff, but they are super reliant on this robotic assistant totally now where it's like uh may's mom molly she has to do her yoga lessons and is putting on vr and the cubot like kind of guides her through as her yoga instructor or how the uh, other the rival soccer girls they use the robots as their bullies so it's like instead of me beating you up 
because I'm bigger and stronger than you or I just hate you more, I'm going to have this robot assistant just take you down and just the cleverness they have with the robots and why David Cro- David Cross is so good in this is just like that robot uh, syncopation he has with his voice where it's just like, oh, you're going to have a little bit of a beat down now and just like <laughs> having this like super positivity to it. Or one of my favorite scenes is uh, that when Molly and May are making their way to the IQ Robotics keynote, uh, that uh, her previous model is just like, it's okay that Gen 6 can- has much more LEDs than me that can make uh, that can actually adhere to your emotional needs more than I can. And so he's just like willingly saf- sacrificing himself for the next model. It's like going <laughs> that on was Safari just- on your iPhone uh, 10 to order the 10s. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's all it's and and your 10 has given you constant feedback about like oh it's okay to upgrade and get rid of me because this one will be better and your life will be better it's getting the push it's, notification with the email says the 10s is here buy it yeah and things like that i mean they have a cleverness but also an underlying creepiness to them that kind of works for that this is a very colorful dystopia whether we want to say, hey, this is really cool. Those robots are really neat and everything. That it, it's not a it's not a bad world, but there's a is a lack of uh, freedom in this world, which is very disturbing as well. Especially when it comes to everything's a robot, where a comb is eagerly wanting to comb your hair, or a toilet eagerly wants to. Uh, take your poop i guess <laughs> or a toothbrush <laughs> that just want to jumps in your mouth and get rid of those cavities creepy. it makes for some very creepy moments that i thought were really well done too yeah we should talk about that a bit because it what was really cool was that you know every time you see a robot in the distance or to the side it's fulfilling a function and it seems like oh yeah that could be useful but may who has this inherent uh, just like distaste for robots and is constantly annoyed by them. Uh, through her, we get to experience that emotional, that like that negative reaction that she has because the robots are so obnoxious, but also so invasive. And it was really funny in the, be- in the beginning, seeing the car when the robot jumped up and like forced itself on her to brush her hair. It was a little weird, but it was funny. But then it was like super weird for me when the toothbrush robot was like super aggressively just trying to force its way into her mouth and she was fighting it off and with these camera angles that turned it into like an actually cool looking fight scene like yeah. that came out of nowhere and like those camera angles killed me i was dying but also super uncomfortable because it's like yeah like what is that like in a world where a robot that has at least some level of sentience decides that it's time for you to have your teeth brushed and you just don't fucking feel like it <laughs> like yeah. what is that like what does that like that, that look like what does that mean Yeah, or that mailbox that was just constantly like, you've got mail, you've got mail. And then the mail just, (laughs) it just vomits up mail when you tap on it. And then the mail starts talking to you. And it's like over over automation of things is what it's all about. And only 90s will remember that. That one of her uh, one of her first things she does when she befriends 77 is have him kill the mail robot. I'm like, (laughs) oh my God, you are, you just hate robots to a T, don't you? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the fact that she immediately like demanded robot or Project Seventy Seven go on a genocidal rampage of his own kind was a bit uncomfortable from a high from a high level standpoint, <laughs> but it was really entertaining to watch. Very uncomfortable for me. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're showing a lot of different. They, he's straight up killing a bunch of you know obviously inanimate objects, but we've already seen that you know they show some a, a bit of pieces of emotion. That's why when and effectively when I saw him just like straight murdering all these robots, I'm like, is this okay? I don't know if this is okay. And then she started also murdering robots. And I'm like, why do you hate technology so much? But you're still using it for your advantage. My it's, it's favorite kind of example. Like, my favorite example of her being annoyed by robots was when she's exhausted coming home from school and her mom's ignoring her. She goes to the kitchen and she makes herself a, a cup of instant noodles and oh the instant God. noodles like comes alive and starts singing a song about soup to her. And she was just like so <laughs> pissed off. It was so funny to me. I couldn't. Oh man. I like that the instant noodles self heated themselves. So that yeah, that's pretty dope. I-, I could live in that future. <laughs> Do you want your house to welcome you home? Your door? No, oh, man. My house would see some things. Uh, <laughs> not my whole house, but there are definitely some things that I wouldn't mind having automated. 
Um, I can't think of them yet, though. Probably my toilet. That would be funny. <laughs> Have a toilet that was just super eager for you to piss in its mouth. Like that'd be hilarious to me. <laughs> I think you could find some people on Fifth Ave that would have people. people. You don't need crazy, robots. Yeah. The worst thing, the crazy thing about that robot too, to me, was the fact that it had arms and hands, which means that I assume that means you. it probably wipes you for you. And that's like, it's just super invasive. Every robot that she encounters is way, way invasive. I wouldn't trust that robot. I'd be like, you came up one wipe too short and now I'm just <laughs> like crap the entire day. I would not oh trust God, that I robot. I was worried that it would literally tear me apart. <laughs> like, no, I don't want a robot that doesn't throw the sensitivity of my butthole wiping me. Let's continue on talking about the likeness <laughs> of other films and the violence in Next Gen. Can I, uh, so, so can go I ahead. give like a, a segue point uh, between this? Um, yes. Between the, the plot and then like the likeness to other films. So Netflix is making proof, proof of concepts, right? This is... Basically, Netflix has two years, two to three years, right, before Disney gets up and running on their streaming service and then just utterly will take a huge portion of that market share, right? Um, This is their attempt at making a Pixar movie, and they did it pretty well. You know, like this is this is them saying, hey, we can compete in this market space we're not going to we're not going to advertise it as much but like it's it's going to be there and let's see how well it does um i mean granted we could probably do the bright thing and figure out how many views it has through the first one of you guys can look that up um but this is arguably a better proof of concept of uh market share than bright was you know bright was like their big Hollywood-esque sci-fi type dirty movie, you know, that like is super big in Hollywood right now. And it wasn't that good. You know, it was it was okay. I think we came to the conclusion that it was like a decent movie, but like there was clear holes. Yeah, there was big holes in it. Whereas this felt like something that could have been released and done fairly well. Like I don't think it's as big as like some of the biggest Pixar and Disney animated films but it is certainly better than a lot of the mid-range movies that we've reviewed in the past um and i think this is an important movie to like really really say that netflix is its own total company rather than some something that has a couple tv shows and like maybe a movie or two and then a bunch of documentaries that everyone likes like this really helps prove that netflix is a force to be reckoned with in any sort of the movie or any sort of visual genre, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. you made that point, blew it earlier, uh, or just this point about how Netflix is sort of like, a, there's all this ver- like vertical integration going on where it's just taking in parts of the, um, the entire ecosystem that goes into creating, delivering entertainment and incorporating it into its own company or figuring out ways to do it itself. And it made me think about the fact that, you know, earlier at the beginning of this podcast, you, I believe you mentioned this, but um, someone mentioned how, like, none of us really knew this movie was coming out until it came out and how we looked at, viewed that as a negative in a, in a, in a sense. But now that I think about it, you know, Netflix is its own advertising system. Because the moment you turn it on, it's showing you what's new right there on the screen. And for me, I get emails from Netflix to the uh, email address that I've signed up to, with the account on uh, when things get announced, when things are being released. And they rarely message me ahead of time and say, hey, in two months, this movie's coming out or, or Iron Fist Season 2 is coming out. No, they just send me an email the day before or the day oh, of. Wow. And I'm like, oh, sweet. I get to just enjoy this. There's no wait time. And that's actually really effective for me. That makes me want to like, watch these things. Like, I didn't i wasn't leaning in on on watching next gen on my own but I, it did catch my eye when i saw it pop up in my notifications and you know i'm glad that i wound up watching it for the podcast because it turned out to be a great movie but i definitely knew about it because netflix told me when it came out and i think that's that's pretty ingenious on their part and that's important because for them they they don't get advertisement on abc or espn or uh what's the other big disney or Disney Network, like they don't have any sort of television presence whatsoever. Logo. So they have to, yeah, they have to get people logging into the app consistently on every device to be able to push this content. Again, they're they're on a two to three year countdown. They either put enough stuff out that people 
will stay loyal to them or Disney will destroy them with their own streaming service. Disney is about to open with probably Toy Story 4 on DVD. They're going to open with a bunch of Marvel shows, which from the sounds of it are going to be heavy Ooh. hitters. Like it sounds like they're going to open wait. it with Scarlet Witch and Loki, which is way more in inviting than any of the Marvel shows that are on Netflix as good as some of those have been. Um, and so like they're, they're just going to open up with this resounding Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa swing for the fences that Netflix has to be there to be the Randy Johnson or Pedro Martinez and strike their ass. <laughs> like they, 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 they pretty Boo. much, they are on such a countdown of like, non-existence unless they catch up in almost every department which also includes animated films They're straight up blue we, blue we're we, like you should know your audience not many people are going to be baseball fans they just drop the names and people are going to be thought, like yeah yeah I yeah most I of our fans were 75 year old men that's true 75 <laughs> year old men russian men right i thought most of our fans were were horny virgins that's I think also Ryan true. Down has two kids, so he is at least not a virgin. <laughs> I don't know, man. There's been some marvelous advances uh, in modern medicine. Technologies are. Amazing. I thought Ryan, aka, I thought Ryan Down was our only fan. <laughs> he is. Well, there is there is that. He Derek also seventy five years old. So, oh, and there is Derek Song. That's correct. Yeah, he man. also has a kid. That's disproving everything. <laughs> <laughs> two fans that disproved the tropes, the stereotypes. I appreciate it. <laughs> Listen, if you're a horny virgin and you listen to this podcast, hit us up on Twitter. <laughs> from DIF at DIFP. <laughs> Underscore DIFP. Yes, we need to know. We need to know. All right, guys. What else do we uh, need to talk about tonight? Um, I know the one thing I had, uh, one thing that was curious for me, I know we mentioned it before, is the fact that, you know, this movie was PG. And it felt like I thought watching this movie the entire time was at least PG-13 just because of the swears and the bleeps and the amount of violence. And the fact that I actually had not seen, um, you know, violence against humans in like an animated a way like this because i thought it was kind of weird that you know these all the little robots that was like still bullying and still helping like beating her up and like knocking books out of other people's hands and um just kind of seeing that i thought it was kind of weird um about that so i was like oh i mean i i obviously you know i'm old enough to kind of watch this but i was curious to know and i think we talked about it a little bit but i'm wondering what other people's like children and um you know families who may have watched this movie that is you know maybe like a little bit of a disney movie like how are they um feeling about this movie and the amount of like bleeps and cuss words and stuff like that yeah Riley. uh yeah so the movie the disney movie i relate this to most is like big hero six because we both have like uh young leads that have lost something significant that are trying to find their way a bit more uh but plus they all both have giant robot bodies and baymax is definitely adorable and cute and everything i wouldn't take anything away from baymax but i think with the relationship they build here with uh may and uh project 77 it becomes a better movie and the mo- the reason a big reason for that is how much ration, uh, rationale they put into the film that these are believable things that when the good scientist gets killed, it's very sudden and shocking. and He just gets evaporated right in front of you. And you're just like, holy shit, what just the hell happened? He is dead and gone. He's not going to be able to help at all. It, no, just, no funeral. Nobody says anything about it. Yeah. He straight up gets shot, and that was it. Let's just move along. Not even a dust devil. He's just <laughs> dead. And there's a lot of times where, yeah, the the violence is very, very real. And I thought that actually played to its strengths. Where when the uh, when the soccer bullies uh, have the robots actually. They don't beat up May. They hold her down so they can get a good look in. And so it's something where it's like, hey, I, I'm not going to use this robot to do all my dirty work for me. I'm just going to make it where I have the advantage and you don't. And I think that would be something that you would see kids do to one another. It's that um, I'm not just going to take it out on you. I'm going to be a little bit smarter with it. Uh, but also, we do see a lot of robot-on-robot robot violence. I mean, uh, 77 is a soldier robot. It's a weaponized... It's a weapon. 
and for it to actually learn to be more of a friend, more of a buddy and everything, it's, it is a path that you actually see it actually, uh, see it just straight up annihilate things that it thinks is funny. And, but at the same time, you see these robots that are, uh, amalgamations of like civil servants, you would see like cops and security guards and everything. And 77 just straight up like, Oh, boom, you're evaporated. And you're like, Holy shit. He just took out a cop. And that's not, that's not cool. I guess. I mean, to use a sword to chop one in half, is that cool? <laughs> yeah. Like, he's, like that was like the first thing that he did, and they played it for a joke. But I'm like, is this going to come back at some point? Because he's straight up killing all these police officers that are robots. But I can understand this, you know, throwing them in the air and blowing them up. And we see that a lot. But he also was like chopping off the arms of some, chopping off the heads on some. And I'm like, this is pretty terrible. This is kind of terrifying if I was in this world. Uh, but you know, I will say this though, growing up in the nineties, um, my folks would totally have let me see this movie. Yeah, There's too, no actually. difference from bleeping those swears than whatever Joe Pesci was doing in home alone. I freaking mm. love that movie. And you're telling me that some <laughs> guy is slipping over the ice and going, <laughs> he wasn't dropping 97 F bombs in there. Just, you know, <laughs> censored quote unquote, his own unique way. There is no difference between that character and then Michael Pena's Momo in uh, this movie. Like there's, there's none. Um, in fact, I think it'd be funny because like I could see myself at 10 censoring myself out and not and my parents laughing because they they knew I didn't actually know what I was saying. Yeah, you freaking ice hole, you mother trucker. I mean. Right. Oh, oh trust <laughs> yeah. me. And not, yeah, like, and especially once you figured out what those words really mean and that you could get away with saying close enough words to them and your parents yeah. didn't get angry. <laughs> like, that was the greatest, like, t- completely... I didn't see it. The other thing is that an easy, easy way around all this stuff is to commit violence towards non-human things. The robots weren't C-3PO. They weren't, uh, you know, they weren't the vision. They were like, they were, they were non anthropomorphic robots. And so being able to separate the violence between a humanoid versus a trash can is very easy, I think. And it's very easy to like say, Hey, this isn't real violence because a human being is not really getting hurt. And I think in the situations that the robots, like they never really showed a robot blowing up a real human being, you know, any of those shots were very far away. And even like you said, the hold down scene was, was the human was really the violent one. The robots kind of held held me down that's it you know like there wasn't anything really more malicious there like the human was the one who actually committed the violence and everyone kids included and especially their parents could be like oh yeah this is a bully this is a human that's doing the wrong thing someone who looks like you or like your classmates like don't do this um yeah i did like the fact that the uh that the bully was a girl also you know there were other like boy soccer players there and they could have easily gone with the trope of just having them being like rude boys or whatever but mm-hmm. uh like little girls can be really mean um usually way meaner than them boys can be when it comes to like dealing with one another so i appreciated that they put that in the movie like they didn't just si- sideline the rival female and have like boys do like the tough work she was a jerk and she was really mean and nasty uh so i, I appreciated that that aspect of it it also yeah, i like that with a love that- story yeah, and like I the, like that May. the bully being like a dude, and like have it be like, oh, they're kind of into each other at the end. Like that's mm. that's half those tropes, right? Yeah, yeah. I think also one cool thing with May is just like the amount of violence she was showing was very real for someone that's like kind of acting out. That when she confronted her bully the first time, she just straight up kicked a soccer ball in her face, which mm-hmm. I thought was amazing. And uh, also when. The second time she confronted her bully and had the baseball bat, that was actually a lot more frightening and scary. And you're just like, May, you're just going down a very bad path right now. And that was the point where 77 had to actually jump in and uh, kind of like talk her out of actually cre- creating something that she doesn't want to get into. 
where she shouldn't get into that. Yeah. She's angry and hates the world and everything. And she's going to lash out at anybody that she sees needs to take punishment on, but she needs to make sure she finds a focus. And I think that they do a really good job of showing that, Hey, uh, kids can act to this level of violence. And I think that's something that's really good to understand that if you have a kid that is pissed off at something, you're not sure what they're pissed off at. I mean, start talking to them just like how mm-hmm. 77 does that. It's going to be a journey in a, in a road that it's not something you just turn on off and on. It's something where rage will happen and that you have to address or they do become something that you don't want them to be. Whereas I think it's really interesting that we find out the end that Justin Penn is not Justin Penn. He's an Android created by Ares to continue to portray Justin Penn and Justin Penn is dead because we hear that the final thing he tells Ares to do is make the world perfect. And we find this whole pattern with all the robots in here, they are made to do their, do their programming and they're very obsessive with that programming to a fault where they're overly eager as well. And Ares was just kind of like the rest of the robots where it's like, all right, I'll make the world perfect by destroying the thing that makes it imperfect was this humanity. And I thought that was really neat how they uh, brought that little twist in with Justin Penn that whoever killed the good scientist at the end wasn't a human at all. It was actually the robots. Yeah, I did enjoy that. And it's a trope that we see pretty often in any sort of movie that deals with artificial intelligence. You know, the uh, AI gets smart so smart that they realize that the best way to keep humans safe is to save them from themselves. And then they turn down a dark path. We've seen that in iRobot, in Age of Ultron, in any number of sci-fi movies. But uh, that being said, I thought it was pretty well well executed uh, for this movie also. And um, I really dug the how kind of gruesome that final fight scene was when uh, Pym's uh, like robot replacement gets his body all mangled up and is still like dragging his broken limbs like around and like his head is caught to the side. Yeah. 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 And his eyeballs is popped out and he like has his gun to the robot's head and is talking about like, like killing it. And it's, you know, it was really, it was actually kind of creepy and really like I thought well animated just the way his body looked lurching forward. And that's kind of nightmarish if you think about it from the perspective of a kid's movie. Um, but I liked it. I appreciated that they went that way. And, you know, I thought it would make for a cool and compelling final villain that was filling the role of a trope that's pretty common uh, in and of itself. I even like the the entire ending sequence that you even said about Mocha. And I know I mentioned something about the violence, but I did I did thoroughly enjoy the fact that, you know, and we I, I know I was talking a little bit about music before, but there was something that was very um uh, peaceful yet it was shot very well uh that entire like the final sequence that entire robot battle i thought was probably one of the better parts of the movie by not only how it was animated how it was actually shot but just to see the overall scale of this place of what we were doing and um how it didn't necessarily feel like a regular like beam in the sky sort of thing. I definitely felt like they were trying to have different things at what they were doing. And it also felt like a different robot battle. You know, a ma- majority of the time, I literally couldn't get Wally, Iron Giant, and Big Hero 6 out of my head. Um, because it felt like it was a hodgepodge of all of these, all of those movies. And granted, I think all those movies are better than this, but I think this movie at, at least does an action sequence or the action sequences a little bit better. Um, yes, it does the action sequences a little bit better than all those other movies. And I think this was another way to see that, you know, they had, um, a pretty, uh, soothing, but kind of like upbeat sort of music um, to the actual score while uh, this battle was happening. And you can t- clearly see that um, Project 77 is giving it his all when he doesn't have guns. And I think that was another sort of uh, a way to just to show like that's why I enjoyed that character or that robot more because I felt like that <laughs> robot, although, you know, it was obviously the robot was definitely um give it a lot of chance to kind of shine and like talks about a lot of different pieces and points of sacrifice um so i really did enjoy that entire final sequence i thought that was pretty cool it, it yeah, i thought me. that final sequence was amazing because you're also cutting the action which is very anime styled with this loss of memory and it's like every single time he loses a memory a new weapon 
becomes available to him. Mm. And it's kind of very telling in that point where it's just like, oh, it's he's going to he's got a chance to win. He gets another chance to win. But also at the same time, he's losing this thing that he's always valued. And it's very heartbreaking at the same time when you see it. I like yeah. it from a perspective that I thought it was a better fight scene than Man of Steel. You essentially have <laughs> a somewhat similar thing, especially the culmination being in space. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a huge perspective. Uh, one other smaller thing on that was uh, when they went up and they flipped it around to the human perspective. Also, they had the Batman scene, too, where he like she was running through the smoke to get there. Besides the point, whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they they did a great thing when they showed it from the people's perspective, where they just show, showed the red and green, not even lights and beams, but just flashes in the crowd or clouds. Uh, that was incredibly powerful just to yeah. like show it just being two distant beings that were just duking it out. And you really had no idea who was winning. I thought it was very effective. Also, Warren loved the score during that mm-hmm. moment, like legitimately loved it. It was yeah. it was the visuals on screen uh, like I, was it Brylin was talking about with like deleting the memories with the weapons. Um, plus, that score was just very, very powerful. Uh, I mean, and I think, you know, the first thing I actually noticed about this movie was the first thing I noticed about The Predator, uh, but was the score. I think the first the first opening song um, that was used, I think that was also very engaging. It was very warm and it was um, definitely inviting you into this new world. I was super curious to see who actually did the actual score. And I guess it was from a pair, Samuel Jones and Alexis Marsh. Um, and looking at some of their work and just in their IMD page, doesn't even look like they've done too many uh, pieces of work. They have like about, you know, uh, it says 82 credits, but a lot of them have been uh, different shorts, TV shorts, documentaries. But I don't think there's been a big um, uh, like feature film almost in for inside their entire sort of um, work that they've done. So I was curious to see if this is like actually the largest film um, for a while. And I'm looking all the way back from, you know, 2011 and everything else is a video short TV movie, short, short, short. Um, so looking at it, even in the last, you know, five to six years, I think this may be one of the largest scaled movies that they've done. Uh, and so I'm super curious and I'm very excited to see uh, at least hear more of their work. And I'm probably going to see if I can visit the score um, probably this week. Yeah, one thing I'd also add about the uh, ending is that um, after the battle, it's it's interesting to see uh, May break down when uh, she realizes she lost her friend, and we've and we they have a really interesting ending where um, seventy seven does beat up uh, does defeat Ares, and he's like broken down to this this little red eyeball on a stick, and the uh, and when she realizes she lost her friend, is not like a hump, hunkered mask and, or, or actually a mass of uh, like destroyed seventy seven parts. It's when he reboots and his eyes come back on. His smile's not there anymore. He goes, "Hello, who are you?" Which she actually I thought was just like really cool to see that they were going to pull this thing that it's all it was, even though he's physically still there, that his memory's lost and that. It's it's interesting to see that they continue with that trope and still played it so seriously that I appreciated that they took it all the way to the final result of that. And that in the end, she keeps the promise she made to him that I got your back. And they both say, I got your back throughout this movie. Also, there's a lot of hip hop references in this movie, too, which I found pretty interesting. <laughs> um, but um it's really cool to see that she's kind of reenacting the memories that they had in a different way um, to kind of bring back some of those old memories, but also start to make new ones, which is really cool. Like Momo even approaches him different for the first time again, which I thought was a really neat perspective that she may not get the original friend she had back, but she's going to make a friend out of this robot some way, somehow. Yeah, I I really appreciated that they went through with it because it it gave the movie 
stakes. The fact that they followed through with it meant like re uh, validated the stakes that were proposed initially, and it would have been so easy for them. And honestly, for me, it was expected that when he rebooted after the battle with Ares, uh, like I completely expected them to do something like uh, downloading like like core database from the cloud or something like that. And he might have some memories or something like that. Like, I really thought that they would take it, take that way out because that's sort of like the natural progression for any sort of children, you know, children's movie. And they didn't, they were like, Nope, this is, he lost his memories and he had to make that choice and he made the choice. And now you both have to live with that and figure out how to live life moving forward. And that's another good moral to teach kids, (laughs) you know, that your actions have consequences and you have to deal with those consequences. Even if it doesn't end terribly, you do things and there are uh, there are reactions to those things. And I really appreciated the movie for it in hindsight. Yeah, that's a good call out. I'm really glad that you um you even saw that. I, I think I meant to kind of talk about that, but I really did like the fact that the actions and i even i don't know if you've even picked it up on the fact that when the the doctor the smart guy that was played who died um can't remember his name right now um but the when his character was kind of looking for tanner rice tanner rice thank you might as well call him Uh, wozniak very true very true (laughs) but i thought it was also interesting because i was curious to see how um project 77 was um acting and how he was feeling about all the things that he was doing and so when we looked at it from his perspective and when he was looking for the actual um you know he when he was looking for project 77 it definitely felt like um he didn't want to be doing what he was doing but he was still trying to help out you know may as much as possible so i thought that was another kind of interesting tidbit of they were kind of focusing on his uh facial expressions and uh it definitely wasn't any sort of joy in his like eyes or um i think he had a mouth at the time and eyes and like was kind of frowning and kind of sad of i shouldn't be doing this why am i doing this um so i thought that was another other tidbit to a note Anything else before we get into our lasting thoughts? Mm. That's a David Cross. Mm. Do you want to okay. be an actor? Mm. <laughs> so I will be I'll, singing I'll, this in the key of David Cross. Mm. I will oh, no, 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 no. Right. A, you, you could be a therapist. We're going to offer you six figures in this job. Mm. No. <laughs> so let's get into our final thoughts. Brylan, talk to, talk to me about this movie. Would you recommend this movie? And if so, what other movie would you suggest people to watch before this movie? Uh, I highly recommend this movie. Um, I was very surprised at how well made it was given it was a Netflix only release. And I was very happy to see that it actually has very strong storytelling to it that I think is very up to par with what the best of what Pixar and Disney does. Even though the dialogue is a bit simplistic, I think this is definitely something that I think uh, that children should watch and parents should show their kids because it's got some really important life lessons and it doesn't really uh, gloss over like the consequences of actions, which I very I respect it for wholeheartedly for showing that that it's something that uh, it's a movie that I feel that out Disney's Disney in a way, which I think is really cool. Mogo, what you got? This is a movie that I had no interest in seeing, but I'm very glad I did. Uh, it was a remarkably po- it was remarkably polished and had a great cast and a really solid story that didn't take the intelligence and emotional complexity of children for granted. I think that I agree, Brylan. This is a movie that approaches Disney and Pixar level. I think that once Netflix finds a way to uh, do stories that are very original and not just uh, you know like well done amalgamations of other stories, then they'll be fully in contention with Disney, Pixar, and anyone else that comes their way. But this is a remarkable step towards that, and I have full confidence in them after seeing this movie. Um, Everyone should see it. And the rapey toothbrush is something that I'm going to have a hard time forgetting about. (laughs) (laughs) Hashtag rapey toothbrush. Uh, Blue, what do you got? So, yeah, I agree with uh, the two of you guys. Um, this was a great proof of concept. 
uh, it. I think you're right. If they can flesh out a couple things, they will be competing with the major like kids, you know, that Disney, Pixar, DreamWorks for significant children eyeballs. Um, it also helps that it 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 was a pretty decent uh, like movie for adults too. I mean, all of us are on the other side of 30 and we are all looking at this as like a movie that we we enjoy. Except for Warren. Warren is 22. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so I'm definitely going to uh, piggyback on what everybody's saying here. I guess my one thing is like, I would definitely recommend to watch and check out the movie. Um, I would say, you know, definitely check out and probably want to watch. I know I mentioned this before, but I think this movie closely blends with Iron Giant and Big Hero 6. Um, just because of the weapons and the design from both of those um, uh, movies. Um, and I like this movie. I mean, the movie is on Netflix, right? So you definitely, I will suggest, you know, definitely go take a look at it. Definitely take a watch. You know, you can get something for a little bit more um, than before. I definitely see that it does a lot of other stuff that Disney doesn't do. Uh, but the one thing is, I felt like they were definitely doing a lot of things that Disney has already did. Not saying you get, you, like, you have to come up with an con- entirely, completely new story, but I was just talking about more along the lines of the actual um the look of the characters and just a feel for things that was actually happening i felt like it could have been different i really wanted michael pinion to be cast in a different character as a whole i think he was pretty much wasted on the dog that we can only understand one person can actually understand it and everything else felt like a visual gag um so that was kind of a bummer i kind of wanted michael pinion to be a bit more prominent character i think you know, Michael Pena could have played any, really any other role here um, that would have uh, given the ability to shine a bit more. But it's an animated movie, and you know, people gonna do what they need to do. So, it could have been a you, storytelling robot that actually narrated the whole story. <laughs> that'd be great. That'd be cool. Would you have preferred that David Cross played the dog and Michael Pena played every robot? Yeah, probably. Interesting. Yep. I don't know. I'm not a huge, I, my, my, I'm not a huge David, David Cross, Cross fan. David Cross can say old timey stuff to me any day, and it will <laughs> always be good. Always, well, it's, 100%. It's, it's weird, you know. Why not have like a mix of just random voices play a bunch of different characters? I understand you can still have David Cross play five, six, seven different characters, but Michael Pena can also play more than one character. What if they just and have, I was also curious. Well, but I was you curious to, to see. Did hair? you see? I mean, I'm kind of. Brush your hair. Yeah. Do Do we see any other animals in this movie besides the one dog? That was the only animal ever. Humans. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. I will say that it makes sense for David Cross to be all those characters because all the robots were based based off of David Cross Wozniak's original design. So, like, his voice was just a template for all of them because he was the the actual like genius behind them, even though. Uh, Jason Sudeikis slash Steve Jobs was the uh, like business mastermind. Business man, yeah. I love how it was just like a complete and blatant <laughs> like yeah, allegory well. to those two people. There was no hiding that whatsoever. I even saw I, I saw the flip flops. I'm like, he's in flip flops and jeans. It has like a ponytail. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and he's walking out at like an event. Like, come on! I just like the uh, event was just so overdone. It was just like a big like. Super studio event. He's we just know like you'll love it. On and the one stage. more thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, as an Apple, as a uh, as an Apple fanboy, I felt personally attacked when uh, they got out on stage and said that it was just like the other one, but better. <laughs> I was like, God damn it! <laughs> I, I, it's I, true. I love the, the last one you're ever going to have to buy until next year's one hits. Like that. That to <laughs> yep. me was too real. <laughs> And with that, we are the Down in Front Podcast. Thanks so much for attending our review of Next Gen that is on Netflix for right now. Brylan, where can people hear and find more of your work? Uh, you can find me eagerly wanting to accept people's shit on Twitter at Brylan, B-R-I-L-U-N-D. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram at I am Brylan, uh, where I post many TV and movie reviews from time to time. Just recently put one up for Mandy. And also, I am the host of the Gamescast, twitch.tv slash downfront podcast. We are playing through Spider Man on the PS4. It is an amazing uh, game that has a really cool story brewing in it as well. I think it's really, I can't wait to get back into it. And uh, hopefully, I can hop on there. I'm actually taking the day, a couple of days off this week on Thursday. So, 
keep an eye out, keep it locked for some Monster Hunter. Pretty pumped about that in the game cast. Uh, Mocha Mike, where can people find more of your work? Yeah, well, you can find me on Twitter, uh, posting videos of me forcing myself onto unsuspecting toothbrushes at Mocha Mike Li, as the Lord intended. Uh, unfortunately, it's not Mocha Mike. The person who has that uh, was murdered and replaced by a robot several years ago, and that robot refuses to give me that name. So Mocha Mike Li is where it's at for now. You can also find me on Instagram at Mocha Mike, where I post my photography work, and on Medium, also at Mocha Mike, where I post some longer form reviews of the shows we talk about today. Here. Always good stuff. Uh, Mike the Shredder Blew It. Uh, where can people find more of your work and what shows you got coming up? Uh, nowhere and nothing. Um, so you can find us on the internet at My News Band or My News Music. Uh, check us out. We eventually will do something. Um, and honestly, like, oh, God, brain freeze. Brian, what did you want? <laughs> <laughs> your brain froze over your nothing. <laughs> yeah, uh, hang on. What did Brylan say? <laughs> what do you mean? What did oh, Brylan say? Good, it's such a good. I said show. eagerly wanting to accept uh, other people's shit on Twitter. <laughs> no, after that, um, that uh, I posted a mini movie review of Mandy on Instagram. Never mind. All right. So we got a brown poop Spider-Man. joke. We had a Mike, Mocha Mike uh, somewhat dick related joke. Uh, <laughs> I don't exactly know what these were supposed to be, but they make reference into what they said earlier. Um, you could also find me at Jesse Rand's slipper party dot com. Uh, that again is Jesse Rand's slipper party dot com. Reach <laughs> out to me there. I'm sure I'll respond to you eventually. So random. And we have in the Down to Front podcast. Definitely check out more of our work. We have a website, downtofrontpodcast.com, where you can go take a look at you know our bios, find out some more information. We have SoundCloud information on there, GameCast information on there. If you want to actually kind of sign up and you can find our Twitter. So definitely check out more of our work. Twitter uh, is at underscore DIFP. So underscore DIFP for Twitter. If you want to look for, for us for Facebook, so we do have a Facebook sort of page there, facebook.com slash down to front podcast. Really, if you search any of the actual platforms i mean we're on spotify we're literally everywhere on the internet just all you have to do is search down front podcast.com and if you like what we do you want to become a patron for having you know early episodes and bonus materials definitely consider becoming a patron patreon.com slash down in front podcast anything and everything helps and uh prices on a can so just for one dollar that'll be awesome uh, thanks so much for everybody uh, i appreciate everybody coming on joining in for us tonight um our next review will be hellfire Hellcast? Hell fest. Hell, hell fest. fest. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I like don't know. Like that... fest, but in hell. Ah, okay. I don't. I really hope that we're on a good binge for a good amount of movies. Um. So I'm super pumped for that. Also, there was somebody brought up something interesting. The fact that um I don't have a nickname, and I think people were upset that uh, the fact that I don't have a nickname on this podcast. Who's people. Um, Emma? You know, listeners. <laughs> yeah. Well, she brought it up. Hi, Emma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's not here, but okay. Uh, she brought it up, and I was like. Yeah, I don't. I guess I don't need a nickname. I don't know. The what about Warren Pookie Jackson? No, I'd rather just be called Warren. So it's okay. Warren, about Teddy Bear? Mr. Jackson, <gasps> if you're nasty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jackson, if you're nasty. That's for you, Mocha. What about Jesse nice. eagerly wants to brush your hair at ymail. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye. Turn off your electronics. No. Except your robot overlords. (laughs) And my dildo.